What happens when a superpower abdicates its throne? My name is Mark Leonard. I'm the director of the European Council on Foreign Relations and a contributor to PS. And today, I'm going to be riding in a cab with Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard University. And we're going to talk great power politics. Well, thanks for joining me in London today, Joe. Nice to be back. <laughs> and the sun is out. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, you've been thinking about power, I think, more than anyone in human history. And the big question about power today, I think, is about China and America. And it's a period where power seems to be shifting from one to the other. The big question, I think, on many people's minds is, is China too powerful or not powerful enough? Well, I think it's a, a bit of both. I, I, in a book that I did in 2011 called The Future of Power, I said there are two big changes in power in this century. One is power transition from west to east, and the other is uh, power diffusion from governments to non-governmental actors. So China is very definitely a west to east question. Uh, but China itself has to ask, what happens as the internet grows? What happens in an information revolution? What's the role of the government? How does it control things? So there are two dimensions in power that we have to think about. But when people think about the relations between great powers, a lot of time people have talked about the Thucydides trap, about um, where, what happens when uh, one great power overtakes another. Do you want to... Oh, well, that's the classic, which is which we've known for 2,500 years, is uh, Thucydides' warning that as a new power rises, it creates fear in the established power, and in that atmosphere of fear, there's a danger that smaller incidents, which otherwise might be accommodated, could lead to war, and you know, the great argument Thucydides made is the war was caused not by uh, the uh, rise of power Athens alone, but by the fear it created in Sparta. And uh, that obviously translates to uh, Britain and Germany and World War I, and many people think it's going to translate to the US and China in this century. And the other thing you've talked about is China not being strong enough. How does that work Well, out? not being strong enough relates to this other dimension of power, the diffusion of power. There are all sorts of things going on, climate change, uh, transnational terrorism, uh, cyber activities, which are uh, not caused by governments, uh, but by many non-governmental actors. And the only way to deal with those is through cooperation. And uh, that means the U.S. and China have got a strong incentive to cooperate. In other words, the U.S. can't stop climate change. China can. Working together, they can make a major difference. But you've, you've written about this thing called the Kindleberger Trap. Well, the Kindleberger Trap is the problem that is a rising power. Uh, it feels its oats. Uh, it doesn't realize that it has to contribute to public goods to things that need cooperation. Uh, the great example of this, the reason I call it the Kindleberger Trap, is Charlie Kindleberger, the great MIT economist, said that the problem with the United States is it became the most powerful country after World War I, uh, but it didn't live up to it. It went back home. And Britain, which had been greatly weakened by World War I, could no longer produce public goods like freedom of the seas or stable international currency, relatively open trade, and the United States uh, should have stepped in to help that. It didn't. It actually turned isolationist, and the result was a disaster. And how led much to of the a, 1930s depression. So how much of a read across do you see to today? Because Donald Trump in some ways is stepping away from the provision of public goods. Paris and, and the decision to lead the Paris climate talks is well, seen I as think, that. I some people. It, and Trump's, China is it stepping up yet. Yeah, yeah, I really. agree. Trump, uh, Trump's uh, decision on Paris was a disaster, a very foolish decision. The uh, interesting question is to what extent China is going to step in. And uh, Xi Jinping's reaction so far has been pretty good. And we'll have to see whether, when it comes to actually making the changes at home that are needed to implement that, whether you can live up to it. But that's a, that would suggest that China understands the Kindleberger Trap. Indeed, Wang Yi, Maybe. the Chinese foreign minister, has referred to the Kindleberger Trap. Said so they're not going to fall into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So um, if you think about these things, there's a kind of mix of theories about how history is made. Some people look more at structure, other people look at more individual decisions and leadership and mistakes that people make. What do you think is more important? Well, they're both. I mean, it, life is made of both structure and agency. And uh, to ignore either side of that is foolish. You know, Marx had this great saying is that men make history to not under conditions of their own choosing. <laughs> and that's about as good a, a bumper sticker as anybody's figured out for that. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We should do this more often. Well, it's a pleasure. <laughs>